This is the story of a man and a woman who lived in a beautiful garden. It's a story of a snake who tricked mankind for thousands of years. It's a story of God and his promises. It's the story of one who's coming back to crush the head of the snake. And to give us that home we once had, we might have forgotten. so great to see you today. I've shared this story with some of you um, some years ago. It was a Wednesday night, uh, and I was heading over to the airport, just over to Love Field, heading to Houston to meet up with Stacy and the kiddos, and I was I had a crazy kind of Wednesday and Wednesday night. It was wild, and I was rushing to the airport, barely made it on time, but got in there, got onto the plane. I'm like, yes, finally, kind of focused. I uh, pulled out a great book, started reading, and I was reading away, just enjoying the flight, when we started to descend and the pilot comes back on and he says, uh, we'll be making our descent into Harlingen. And, uh, and I literally, literally, I looked up from the book and I was like, what? Wait, you know, I'm going to Houston. And, and, and so immediately my mind raced to, I, no, wait, wait, wait. So I moved quickly to get there. I was rushing to get in. I, 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 they wouldn't let me get on the wrong plane, would they? How, I had a ticket to the other. What's going on? And so, I mean, I was like kind of freaking out for a moment. And then he says, I'm sorry, we're actually going to descend into Houston. And then this plane is heading to Harlingen. And I'm like, <gasps> I was like, are you kidding me? And, and then I started to think about this the rest of the flight, um, because this is where how my mind works. And I started to think, OK, it'd be bad enough to get to the wrong destination, right? I mean, if you're on the wrong plane, like, that'd be a real bummer. Like, I'm not going to see Stacy and the kids, evidently, tonight. I mean, that would be bad enough to go to the wrong destination. But I started to think, you know, everything about the flight is wrong. I mean, think about it. The seat I'm in, that's not my seat. My seat is on another plane if I'm on the wrong plane. I'm like, wait, this, everything I'm seeing, the guy sitting beside me, that's the wrong guy. Right? I'm looking out the window. I'm not supposed to see that. I'm supposed to be on another plane seeing other things, meeting other people. The flight attendant, that's not my flight attendant. I mean, it's like a parallel universe going on. My peanuts, those aren't my peanuts. My peanuts are on another flight. I'm eating the wrong peanuts. I've got the wrong pilot. I've got the wrong guy flying the plane if I'm on the wrong plane. Everything about the flight is wrong. You ever feel like in life that you're on the wrong plane? Maybe in some areas of life, I think all of us in varying degrees feel a little bit about this. It, maybe, how about this? Maybe your story is not going the way you planned. We all go through seasons like that. Maybe you're feeling that big time about your own life right now. This is not the story that I intended to live, whether it be in my relationships, my vocational life is not where I thought I'd be at this point. My, my marriage or my, my kids aren't, aren't quite where I want them to be. I talked to one of our, our dads sending off a graduate, you know, he's ready. I hope, right? We're praying over our kids and sending them off. Some of you are weeping in the hallways of preschool this year. I mean, this week. I mean, it's, it's tough. And, and, and we're going, I'm not sure that we're all ready, but think about it. If if you're living this kind of pseudo life, and it's possible to live a life you were never really created to live, and if you, can I say it boldly here at the start, if you don't know Christ, if you're not living in response to what he's done for you on the cross, you're living a pseudo narrative. Because the story that we find ourselves in has been hijacked. This is exactly what the Bible teaches us. We live in a broken and fallen world. And so for some of you, it does feel like I'm living in a parallel universe. And I think for all of us in certain areas of our lives that are not fully submitted to Christ, for some of us, we're in a season where it feels a lot more like the upside down in Stranger Things, where it's like, man, it's me and it's Pete. I recognize this place, but this, there is evil lurking in my life. And a lot of that is because we have given over to, to Satan, to sin in our lives, and it is taking us down, but the Bible says precisely the story that we find ourselves in has been hijacked. And so this month we're going to talk about God's better story. 
Because the gospel is the larger narrative we find ourselves in, and God's calling us back to that story. Because here's the hope. There is hope. Though we live in a fallen world, and we see it every day, I mean, we live in a world, gang, I'm praying earlier this morning with a group of people, we're praying for protection over our children as they go off to school. How crazy is that? We live in an evil, evil world. There there is evil in the world, there's darkness in this place, and the scriptures tell us that's exactly what's happened, but there's hope because God calls us. He's made a way, as we've sung about. He's made a way for us to live the better story. And so throughout this month, I hope you won't miss Uh, A week, we're going to talk about God's better story. Today, we're talking about family because that's where it starts, okay? This is for single adults and and those who maybe are not married and all those things, it's for you as well. But we're going to also talk about God's better story for work and, and for school, God's better story for our finances, for all of this world. And we're going to celebrate as we move into the fall um, all that God has done throughout the summer, all that he's doing. I want you to turn to the book of Colossians, okay, is where we're going to be today. Turn to Colossians. We're going to look at a folk. We're going to focus in on Paul's teaching here, kind of a parallel passage for Ephesians 5 uh, on the family. And we're going to be real practical stuff here today. And then I have a a, a gift for you to take with you and have throughout this fall, throughout the school year. In the book of Colossians, while you turn there, just to set it in context, uh, Paul does what he did in Romans, uh, where last week, you probably remember, if you were here or throughout the summer, we looked at verses, I mean, chapters 1 through 11, where Paul unpacks the gospel. And then in chapter 12, last week, he has the big therefore where he moves from what we say are gospel indicatives, which are just facts about us now. Here's what he's done. Here's what God has done for us. And here's how he has, in, 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 in Colossians, he says he's, he's, he's pulled us out of the domain of darkness. He's transferred us into his family. He's adopted us now. We now have a new identity in Christ. And so he, he lays this out of the first couple of chapters, as he does in Romans chapters 1 through 11. And then there comes a shift where he moves from gospel indicatives to gospel imperatives. This is how we're going to live. So what we've done here, this series serves, if you you come here weekly, and maybe some of you are back from the summer of being gone quite a bit, but now we're going to find ourselves on the heels of this Romans road trip, launched into how do we live the better story in light of the gospel? How do we now live in yet a fallen world? And he kind of sums this up in chapter 3, verse 17. You can see it on the screen there. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Okay? So what I want to talk about is God's better story for family. All right? Because the story of the family, like other stories in our really every domain of culture, has been hijacked. And like any spin off, you know, TV show or sequel to a movie, uh, God's story is much better. The original story is better than the world's story. So we're going to kind of look at three contrasting ways that God's story for family is better. So Colossians 3. Go ahead and turn to Colossians 3. And uh, I want us to to jump in. So let's talk about God's better story for family. Um, What I've discovered is that people who have not fully embraced the love of God, those that don't understand what Christ has accomplished for us, that it's finished, uh, that death is arrested, that he has made us new in him, as we've proclaimed today, uh, many still think that God is kind of this cosmic killjoy in the sky. You know, that he's just repressing us. He's just, he's kind of oppressive. And particularly in this cultural moment, the secular narrative is, of course, we've talked about this, you do you. Whatever makes you happy is ultimately that. Whatever brings pleasure, do that. And anything, how about this, any authority or anyone that would come with some absolute truth about how to live, that's repressive. That is, that's oppressive. That's much more of a Freudian kind of anthropology than it is anything biblical. And so what we find here is many people will just kind of stiff arm God as if, no, 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 no. God is here to repress me, to push me back, to oppress me from my desires. And that's exactly what the Bible says is happening. That he wants us to conform to him and and not to the world. 
but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We looked at last week. First thing I want you to see today is just a general sense for all of us as we dive into this series. God's better story for our lives is not to repress us, but to release us. And you've got to get this right because many, many Christians live this way. And we need to understand that Christ has come to liberate us, not to repress us or, or to, to drive us you know, to an unhappy existence, right? Joy is found in him. Happiness is ultimately found in him. But what the world has done, we've not taken into account this gravitational southbound pull towards sin. And, and we've come to define freedom as doing whatever the heck you want to do, which ironically the Bible calls slavery, bondage because of our bent towards sin. And so look at what he says here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. He starts it out this way, and we're going to land at the latter part of this chapter. But you've got to understand this part. If then, and that word, by the way, really could be translated since, and that's what he's getting to. Hey, the, bi- the big if. Since, since, if you have been raised in, with Christ in a crowd this size, maybe, not all of us, okay, Some of us are still on the journey. Some of us are coming to understand what Christ has done. We're coming to faith in Christ. But if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. I want you to see the contrasting stories here. One is focused on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, that place of authority. So we submit our lives to him, the one who is in authority over all things. Verse two, set your minds on things that are above, not on things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that interesting? We're hidden in him. We we are found in him, this in him doctrine uh, that that Paul talks about. We're, We're covered in his righteousness now. We really unpack that throughout the summer in Romans. Paul goes to great lengths to talk about what that is. I'm totally forgiven. I'm completely new in him. I'm hidden. It's it's almost like say, I'm hidden, you you can't find me. You can't find the old me because I'm hidden in Christ. In fact, you look at me, you're going to see Jesus because now his imputed righteousness has come to me. When God looks at me, he sees me totally forgiven, fully accepted by him. That's who I am. That's what he's saying. Focus on that, on the things above and the stuff that God is calling us to, not the things of the earth. For you have been hidden. Okay, you've died to yourself and you're hidden and your, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life How about that phrase? Christ who is your life. That's my great hope and prayer for you. All of our students and all of our families as we kick off this new school year. Christ who is your life. When he appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So, wow, that sounds like kind of a kind of a leap. But all of a sudden he's saying, no, this is where all of history is going. Ultimately, the story, this story is not about us. It's about him. And it's about his glory. So the story is God's story, right? It's been said it's his story. It's history. It's his story being played out. This story is is not secular. It's spiritual. Secular meaning earthly, material, stuff of this world. It's it's the story that we find ourselves in is not simply sequential. It's timeless. It's eternal. This is the one we find ourselves in. So listen, this school year, I just want to challenge you, all of us here, and maybe you're like, Jeff, I'm not starting school. Well, let this be a beginning point. We're serving uh, this day as a a launching point for all of us as we begin this fall and as we move in to this new school year for many of us. Let your, your minds daily set your minds on the things of God now that you're hidden in him. So our contrasting story, what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God. We've said it. There's only one first. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will fall into place. So parents, listen, some of you, you're adding to your schedule. You're already a little hype. Some of you are a little anxious already. Some of you kicked off school this past week. Some of you are getting ready and you're about, here we go. Listen, before you continue to add, I want to challenge you to make God's word central, to make prayer a priority and to make church activities, ministries a priority in your schedule. Because what happens is, oh, we just get too busy. What does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? It means to be about what God is doing and among his people. Some of us to commit ourselves anew to his church and the mission, the work that he's doing here through our great church. So look at what he says here, and we'll just bust through this one portion to get to 
Really, verse 18 is where he talks about family. So in verses 5, really 5 through 9, he talks about putting off. Okay, and you can see all those things. Things like, he starts with sexual immorality, which is the word pornea, by the way, um, where we get the word porn. Put away sexual immorality, impurity, passion, that's evil desires, covetousness, that's wanting more and more. Think about this. Wanting more and more is idolatry. This is something we, we struggle with. And he says, but, but now, once you walked in these things, but now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander. That's, that's twisting the truth. Obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you put all this off. And then he says, now let's put on uh, this new life. The old narrative, the old story has gone. Let's live out this new story. And then in verse 12, he says, put on. This word is literally clothed. Clothe yourself. Put on. So I could challenge our students. What is your school uniform going to be this year? As you go into the marketplace, into the workplace, what are you going to wear? He says, listen, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. That little word as is the biggest word. In this whole, whole text, probably, as we apply this, he says, above all these things, put on love. Put on love. When people see you at work, when they see you at school, students, when you step onto that campus, may they see love. May they see love above all else. And then he says, now look, let's, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And watch this. Because indeed, you were called to one body. Now he's talking about the church. Sounds like a non sequitur, but in fact, he's saying all of this happens lived out of the community of faith. And so then he says, let's come together singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. And I would affirm you kind of preaching to the proverbial choir. Way to go. You're here. Be here next week. Make it a priority to be among God's people. And then he says, out of this, then here it is again, verse 17. He kind of summarizes it. Let's say this together. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then from there, he says, okay, out of this new life, out of this community of faith, let's talk about family. All right? So here's what I want us to do. The second point I want you to see here is this. God's better story for marriage is where he starts, the primary relationship in the home. God's better story for marriage is not to make us happy, but to make us holy. All right. This is an important concept. If the goal in life is my pleasure, then I'm going to enter into my relationships with others, particularly, uh, I guess I'm going, to, I'm going to try to find the one person, we think, in our culture. This is the, this is the secular story. I'm going to find the person that's going to make me happy. And I talk to to couples all the time who are getting married to say, look, you know he's not going to meet all your needs, all right? Only Christ will do that. And what happens inevitably, I'll have a young couple sitting in my office, and it's essentially that, that, well, I thought he was going to meet all my needs. That ain't happening. And I'm like, you thought he was going to meet your needs? This guy. Really? Uh, You thought she was going to meet your needs? Are you kidding me? You know, we go into marriage with this kind of selfish ambition. You know, I think I think I did that. And, and you know, if, if my marriage is all about Stacy making me happy, then man, I'm going to beat her down. I mean, it's going to be because my needs are like unending, right? Instead, we find our, 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 our needs met in Christ. But notice that it's not about happiness. It's about holiness. And if you know that, then God is using your spouse, he's using your relationships to make you holy. That is set apart as you grow in him. So with all that's being said about Christian marriage or or about marriage in general, there's a lot being said about marriage in our day. The unique thing about Christian marriage is that it's not about the marriage. It's about something else. So the parallel passage, which we've taught before in Ephesians 5, tells us that, that really what marriage is, it's gospel reenactment is what it is. Because Paul says it's like Christ and his love for the church, and he likens the groom with Christ and the bride, his church, us. Okay? 
So, so for some of us men in here, it's like, wait, dude, I'm the bride? Whoa, what, what's up with that? Yes, okay, in this, in this analogy, we are the bride who is loved by the groom. And so I want you to see the first thing that he says, he addresses wives. And here's what he says. I, I just want you to see in verse 18, God's better story for wives is this, embrace. All right, I'm gonna use just, just some key words here for you to, to get this biblical concept as we move forward. And then he says in verse 18, wives, submit to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. And we all cringe just a little bit, especially the women among us, right? Like, like, what, does, what does he mean by submit? Because many people, for many people in our, how about this? Here, here, you talk about countercultural. In our culture, that sounds archaic. I mean, that, that sounds a bit, uh, again, that's, that's repressive. That, that sounds oppressive. And, and, and is this really true? Even like a 21st century empowered woman? Am I to submit to, to someone, to my husband? And some actually want to argue that this is merely a cultural thing in Paul's patriarchal society. But if that were the case, then we'd have to then, then uh, dismiss the other teaching right here. Okay, that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, as we'll see. Or children are to obey their parents. Or fathers, parents, don't, don't exacerbate, don't, don't, don't uh, frustrate your children. And all of those things are clearly true. And clearly it's at the center of the teaching. This is not simply a cultural thing. This is an ongoing thing. It's how the family is to function. God has ordained the family to function in a certain way. So let's unpack this because immediately some of us wonder about this word submit. It means to conform your will or judgment to another, especially out of respect or courtesy. Okay? Now we're going to get to the men here in a moment. But notice it says, as is fitting. It's fitting. And this means to have come to a point so as to make a particular kind of connection. This implies that the, sub, that the submitting to the husband that the wife does is actually a submission. Shows her submission to God and her obedience to Christ, faith in Christ, as she does this. Okay, So this explains why wives should submit themselves is the, is the verbiage. It's not forced on you. This is something that is an active verb. It's not a passive thing that comes from someone else. This is you, and it honors God, and it's the way God ordained the family to function. So if marriage is to tell the gospel story, part of the gospel story is that we submit our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Without submission in marriage, then we miss that part of the gospel story. Okay. Now, remember... Uh, prior to this, he says, we're all submitting our lives to Christ. And then in Ephesians 5, again, the parallel passage, he says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. And before that, he says, be filled with the Spirit. You can't do this if you're not yet submitted to Christ. So, so we don't miss that. Everyone is submitted to Christ. And then out of that, particularly in marriage, comes this submission to one another. There's mutual submission in marriage. In Ephesians 5.23, he provides yet another reason for submission. All right, women, hang with me. The husband is the head of the wife. Headship is compared there to the headship of Christ over his church. Because Christ is the head of our church. Pastor's not the head. No person or group or staff is the head. No, no deacon or any organization within the body. Christ is the head of the church. And so he's the head just as Christ is the head of the church. So how does this work then? Well, he, he's the head of his wife in such a way that he nourishes, encourages her growth. And ultimately, he's responsible, men, for the growth, spiritual growth of his wife. She's to flourish under his love and leadership. But watch this. God's better story for husbands, love. So women are to embrace this, this concept, this, this order, if you will. And then men are to love their wives. Now, what was countercultural um, in the New Testament is this teaching on marriage is the tone with which the patriarch of the family was addressed. This was radical. Because then he says, look at this in verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. 
Now, many of you, many of you guys here are like, Jeff, I got this. Good. Let's move on. I love my wife. Not so fast. You love the cowboys, right? This is agape love. This is Christ-like love is where he's heading here. And, and so he, what is Christ-like love? Well, he died for the church. He makes this explicit in Ephesians 5. I've never met a woman who has said, so, so wait, 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 wait. So I'm to submit myself to a man who's going to love me just like Jesus loves me. Meh. I've never met anybody to respond that way. I think the problem is we wrestle not only with our own sin nature, but we wrestle with maybe husbands aren't loving their wives as Christ loves us. Now, we, none of us do this perfectly, so there's lots of grace. As we submit to Christ, you know, Stacy and I have always told our kids, we were telling our girls growing up, listen, you pursue Jesus with all you've got. And if some young buck is on that track, and if he's pursuing Christ as you are, he might be able to keep up with you. You're going to find a man. We've told our son this. You're going to find a woman who loves Jesus more than she's ever going to love you. We've told our girls that. You find a man who's going to love Jesus more than he will ever love you. You found a good man. And praise be to God, our girls have found some good men who love Jesus with all their hearts. So even our single people, listen, you need to know this, single adults, ultimate, ultimate oneness is not with another person. Not with another person. It's with Christ and Him alone. This is for married people. This is why we get into trouble in marriage. We think that our spouse is going to meet all our needs again. And that's not going to happen. And so husbands, you're to love your wives as Christ loves the church. So you die to yourself to serve her needs. And most women, I think, would like to say, I'm going to follow that man. It doesn't mean that he rules over you in a harsh way, which is why he says, don't be harsh with him. Be loving and kind. I know in our family, you know, there's times when I... I'll submit, you know, to Stacy, where she has greater gifts or understanding than I have. And so there's this constant submission to Christ. But God's better story for the family is, is, is that our marriages focus on holiness, becoming like Jesus, not simply happiness. Look at number three, the last thing I want to see here. We'll unpack a bit. God's better story for family is not to satisfy us, but to sanctify us. Sanctify, it means, you know, or about satisfy. What I mean there is to gratify, to placate, to, to satisfy our every desire in the family. You know, um, this is our problem in marriage again. It's a problem with kids. Our children, they're kind of this unending bucket of unmet needs. And a lot of parents think my role is to meet, you know, all the needs of my kids. If you're seeking to do that, how's that working out for you, by the way? Because their needs how about their wants, will never be met. And, and so the, the purpose of the family is, is listen, the, the family is the central discipleship group on the planet. It's out of the home, out of this loving relationship between mom and dad, that then the family finds its center. And, and, and part of following Jesus is a healthy restraint. So it's when parents are able to say, no. That's not going to happen. That's as part of growing as, as a family. So here's God's better story for kids. Now he turns from wives to husbands. Now he turns to children. So kiddos, listen up. It's to follow. The kids' role in the family is to follow. The family is the first, uh, first social context of faith. It's where we learn. It's the training ground for discipleship. It's the launching pad for a life on mission. With Jesus, it's, it's the place where we, we are sent out, ultimately, tears come into the eyes of our graduates, we're sent out in order to live on mission with him. So God has a word for kids, and here it is in verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. All right, kids, parents, let's say this one together. Y'all ready for this? Let's say it together. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. I saw some of y'all staring at your kids, pointing at them. Um, good, that's good, that's good. And then if you touch them, they listen even better. Children, obey your parents 
You can bring that out this week, all right? And, and it says, in everything. But mom, in everything. Okay, in everything. Let me relieve a little pressure here for our parents, but this is good for, for kids too. Parents, your purpose, again, is not to gratify, placate, and satisfy all of their desires because you can't do that. Have you figured that out yet? Take a deep breath. They're made for God. They're going to find their worth and their value in him. They will never be at peace until they find peace with him. That's why your primary focus is to point them to the one who can meet all their needs and to model that with your lives. Now, this teaching I'm going to offer here is counterculture. I want you to hear this. Uh, if, we, if we shower our kids with attention, they will become self-focused attention addicts. John Roseman, who's written lots of good books on parenting, he offers this analogy. It's like food. He says kids need food, but they don't need a lot of food. They don't need too much food, and they need the right kind of food. If a child gets too much food, they're going to have an unhealthy relationship with food and perhaps lead to all kinds of eating disorders or whatever else, and they're going to struggle with food. Kids need attention, but they don't need a lot of attention. If kids get too much attention, they end up being attention addicts, needing more attention. And it's centered on them. They become the primary focus of the home. And if kids become attention addicts, then they enter into relationships where they need more and more attention, which will never, never be you know, filled uh, or fulfilled in their hearts and lives. They'll have unhealthy relationships with others. They will become attention addicts. And this starts really early on. When, when our kids were preschoolers, it starts as early as, hey, no, no, stop. Don't interrupt the conversation. Mom and dad are talking. You start to teach your child that the primary relationship in the home is between mom and dad. You're awesome, but not that awesome. Okay? Kids are not in a place where they can take over the home. That's your role as a parent. And it starts with simple things. We used to, as the kids got a little older, we used to do kind of the 30-minute rule. Where it's like, dad's home, and man, I, oh, how I missed this. This just came to mind. I, drove, I would drive into the car, carport there, or the you know, garage, and my girl, before I could get out of the car, they would come run and jump in the car with me. <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> um, but, but here's the thing. We'd have a 30-minute rule. As I got older, it's like, no, no, no. Listen, mom and dad time now. Mom and dad now. Go, play, you know, do something else. Not that much attention, right? And, and so they start to learn mom and dad love each other. They're the primary relationship in the home. So kids take their rightful place, which is not at the center. And so there's a big difference, parents, listen, between a parent-centered home and a child-centered home. And I know for some of you with the little ones at home, you're like, Jeff, yeah, how does that play out? I got a kid that, I mean, I was talking to Travis Cook this morning. He was up at, you know, four o'clock with a bottle, right? Some of you were there. And some of you are like, we'd like to have date night, but I got two kids. You know, I'm like, we're running around. How does that happen? You've got to be diligent. And even in the home, you've got to have time. Another way is to put them to, to bed early, right? Like five o'clock. You know, that's good. And then, <laughs> and then you got like four hours um, together. You could go on a date and come back. No, don't do that. <laughs> I mean, you got the monitor. You got the video monitor. Um, we got trouble. Uh, we're, we're 30 minutes away, but we're coming. <laughs> Um, no, don't do that. But, but there's, there's certain things you can do to keep the marriage first, right? Big difference between a, 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 a child-centered family and a parent-centered family, okay? So watch this, though. Now he turns back to parents. After he talks to the kids, now he's got a word for parents. And, and this is for mom and dad both. He says, it says for the fathers. But God's better story for parents is to build. Let me, let me just challenge you with this. What is the end game? What are you really seeking to accomplish with your child on your best days? You're seeking to drive them, to push them, to teach them, to love Jesus with all their hearts. That's where the joy comes from. That's where purpose in life comes. And so you're constantly building into them. Remember, you're to build them up, push them to Jesus. And he says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Don't irritate exasperate, don't provoke to anger is what this is, lest they be beat down and timid. What does this look like? Well, it's constant discipline without affirmation. 
That's a beatdown. It's, it's constantly criticizing uh, and not correcting weaknesses. It's never praising them for their strengths. It's comparing them to others. It's embarrassing them in, in, in front of others. And for some, of, listen, for some, it's placing a tag on, it's tagging them. And what I mean is, oh, this, this is the wild child. Oh, he, he's, the, he's the strong-willed one. Guess what he's going to become? It's self-prophecy. Instead, you're speaking the very best you see in that child. And, and you, you're pushing them to, to envision who God has created them to be and who they will become. So here's what I want to do. I want to challenge you towards a couple of things before we close. I'm going to close our time in a special way in prayer and song. So on Wednesday nights coming up, we've got a thing called Parenting for the Common Parent. I, along with others on our staff, are going to be teaching this, this course. It's going to be diving deeper into what we're talking about here. So I hope you'll come. You can find it in your, your bulletin there. But I also want you to take this out. Would you take this out right now? It's um, God's Better Story for Family. You'll find it in the bulletin there in front of you. I, I put this together some years ago, and Stacy and I have sought to guide our family with what really uh, was originally kind of a top 10 list uh, of a healthy home. And so I want you to take this. I want you to put it on your fridge, all right? I want you to put it in a place. Maybe it's on the dining room table or breakfast table. And I want you to walk through this, depending on where your kids are and age and such. Maybe it's just you as parents to walk through this together. Maybe it's something you could do with a roommate, you know, if you're single. Um, how are we doing in some of these areas? We have, a, we have an irrational commitment to each member of the family. See, we just, we entered into this saying these are our commitments to each other. We communicate with grace, truth and grace. We, we affirm the value and uniqueness of each family member. We vow never to abuse, shame, control, or intimidate one another. You know, that's as simple as saying, we don't talk like that in our family. And parents, stop that early on. Early on. Only loving. Unkind words are not tolerated. We share a, str we share a strong spiritual foundation. I note here, parents recognize that a mild dose of God will never cultivate a life. That is Christ at the very center. What's your ultimate goal in parenting? We, we teach respect for others. And it starts with us. Racism, arrogance, superiority, disrespect for people not tolerated in the home. We instill a sense of responsibility in one another. We play together. I like to think I give our family high marks here. We love to laugh and play and be together. We celebrate rituals and traditions together. Gives a sense of constancy and permanence. Our family did this last year. We're going to do it again next year. We're not going anywhere. We're together. And then we seek help when we come to an impasse. You know, every family runs into trouble. And every family needs a little help from the outside. I know that we have through the years. And there's help. We have professional help. There's help here on our staff. But we want to encourage you. So God's better story for the family is this. Embrace, love, follow, and build. I want to ask you, friend, are you on the wrong plane? Are you on the wrong plane? With the direction of your family, maybe in relationships, your work. Do you feel like you're maybe getting on track? Maybe you're getting on the plane. Dads, listen, I want to challenge our fathers. Two things. One, be there. Secondly, I want to challenge you with this. Get your family on the right plane or everything will be wrong. I want us to pray together. And we're going to enter into a time uh, where we're going to just pray over one another. We have time to do this. Uh, Dr. Adam Wright, who is a dear friend and a great leader. He's the president at Dallas Baptist University. I'm going to invite him to come up and join me here. A uh, member of our church, faithful member, serving with his sweet wife, with the kids in our children's ministry. So we're going to pray over you. And so here's what I want to do. Uh, and we're going to close our time with just a, a prayer before the Lord. And, and, and we're going to sing together out of response of how good he's been to us. So if you're able, I want you to do this. I want you to just get on your knees right where you are. I want you to get on your knees and uh, find yourself right there on your, in your chair. You have to stand up and find your way. We're going we're gonna to kneel here on the altar. 
uh, of, of the Lord before the altar of God. And I just want you to yeah, make your way there to get on your knees if you're able, if you can. God is not as concerned about the position of our bodies as he is the position of our hearts. But, but the position of our bodies say today, Lord, we submit. We submit our lives to you. Out of your great love for us, we submit our hearts and our lives to you. So right where you are, you may be with your spouse, you may be with your kids. I just want you to pray for members of your family right now. I want you to pray for yourself, your role. In response to what you've heard today, just think through how the Spirit has convicted your heart. How do you need to start anew, get on the right right plane, live the better story? Just tell the Lord. Maybe you need to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just tell him how you're going to commit your life anew to him. Serve him. And now Adam's going to pray over us all as we enter into a time of praise and worship that will catapult us, launch us into this coming week our father we thank you so much for the gift of this day for your son Jesus Christ you are king of kings you're lord of lords and father before you created time you knew that we would be here in this moment seeking you submitting ourselves to you father we thank you for the gift of family we thank you for the ability to call you Abba father And Lord, I pray right now as we begin a new semester that your love would just rain down over our students, that you would give them the strength, the courage, the boldness to hug the cross, to keep their eyes focused upon you, the author and perfecter of their faith. Father, we pray protection over our students. We pray that you would surround their schools with just angels, Father, that you would that you would bless the teachers in that classroom, that you would give them hearts of compassion and love. And Father, we pray for our students that you would fill their hearts with love, love for you, our Father, and love for the people that they come into contact with. And Lord, we pray that you would bless them, that you would show favor over them, that you would reveal to them what a good life looks like what happiness, what true happiness looks like, a heart that is submitted to you for your honor and for your glory, Father. We pray these things and we pray protection over our church. Lord, you have established this church and we give this church to you and we ask for your favor over the people of this church. Let us be found faithful in your eyes, O Father, our God. And because of this, Oh, Lord, we submit our lives to you because you are so, so good. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.